Hello everyone and welcome to Creating a Pipeline of Lifelong Learners with Digital Education, a webinar brought to you in partnership between Times Higher Education and Guild Education. My name is Alistair Lawrence, I'm a Special Projects Editor at THE and I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of experts from across colleges in the US and the higher education sector. They are Laurie Dodge, Vice-Chancellor of Institutional Assessment and Planning at Brown University, Lucille Fox, Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs in Provost, the University of Arizona, Lisa McIntyre-Height, Senior Principal of Learning Solutions at Guild Education, Greg Offerman, Associate Director for Advising and Outreach, University of Wisconsin-Madison, Michael Pippinger, Vice President and Associate Provost for Internationalization, University of Notre Dame, Blakely Pomietto, Senior President and, Vice and Chief Academic Officer, University of Maryland Global Campus. Over the past year, digital education has become both more sophisticated and massively increased in its scale. This raises questions about how best to teach and learn online, and also how digital education can better serve the people who need it the most. Speculation abounds about greater job losses caused by the current pandemic, in addition to long-standing warnings that there is a huge amount of uncertainty about what jobs people will do in the future, and how often they will be required to upskill or reskill to remain employable. In recent months, universities have shown themselves to be hugely adaptable and also to continue the important work that many were doing to educate many different types of students online before the pandemic. Over the course of this webinar, we'll be discussing what measures our panellists and their colleagues have already taken and what challenges persist. So before we start the main discussion, I'd like to hand over to Lisa mcintyre height who's going to tell us about how Guild Education partners with colleges across the US to help them deliver their lifelong learning offerings. Lisa? Thank you so much, Alistair, and um, welcome to everyone to our webinar focused on creating learning solutions for, for lifelong learners. Guild is excited to host this webinar along with Times Higher Education. And for those of you who um, aren't familiar with who we are or what we do, we work to connect Fortune 500 companies employees to academic providers that excel in providing education to working adult learners. Um, my name is Lisa and I'm senior principal at Guild and most of my career has really been focused on expanding access to high quality programs for working adult learners and on learning innovation. I'm so excited to be here and, and humbled to be part of the esteemed panel that was just introduced. Um, before we get into the panel and some of the conversation that we want to have today, I do want to just take a moment and share a little bit of context about working adult learners. I want to kick things off and share a bit about um, why we're all here, show the opportunity that exists to serve working adult learners, to share some compelling data that speaks to the challenges that still exist for lifelong learners, and then open it up to the panel where we'll talk through some of those strategies to serve lifelong learners. One of the things that we, we definitely know is that the, that need for lifelong learning is, is large and it continues to grow. And so as you can see here, we have 88 million adults in the United States in need of upskilling. 64 million do not hold a post-secondary degree. And McKinsey actually forecasts that another 15 million will be at risk of automation in the next eight to nine years. So the need for effective lifelong learning solutions and the opportunities to upskill and reskill has never really been more poignant, never been greater. It provides our schools with the opportunity for new and increased revenue streams. It provides access to a very large and motivated student population and the chance to really help prepare the workforce for the future, for jobs that won't be lost to technology so that they can have long and fruitful careers. The population doesn't just need um, a one-time solution, right? And so unlike I think about um, my parents or even myself, I think my dad worked for two companies, only switched jobs twice in his entire career. My mom, I think three times switched employers, but never switched fields. What we know is that on average, each of these people will hold 12.3 jobs in their career. And data tells us that the shelf life of skills is about five years, and that means in a 50 year career, an employee should upskill about 10 times. Furthermore, we know that 75% of CEOs say upskilling will be the solution to their skills shortage. This is essentially really them saying, help, <laughs> education, come step in, help fill this gap, reskill the workforce in a way that's consistent. As all of us know, um, creating an online learning option is, is obviously a great start and one that almost every institution in higher education was, was forced to do when the pandemic hit us a year ago. 
Um, but in and of itself, it's, it's not the solution. And in fact, the emergency remote instruction that happened or that quick transition to, to bringing content online brought to light many of the pain points that exist for students, that exist for faculty, particularly when a digital learning strategy is done quickly and out of necessity versus strategically. And so some of the things that we've learned is that the, our students have expressed challenges when it comes to format. So 60% of students who previously learned in person or partially in person before the pandemic reported a decline in the quality of their education. And again, that probably speaks to that swift move to remote um, emergency education. Simultaneously, 49% of faculty that transitioned to online teaching said they still use the same course instructional materials as they did for in-person learning. And those of us who have been in online learning know that it is not that simple. It's, it's not effective to just simply lift and drop what you would do face-to-face -face and put it online. Time, again, with um, COVID and the pandemic is another challenge. So 43% of Guild students reported changes in work schedule and 51% of Guild students reported an increase in caretaking responsibility since the onset of the pandemic. In addition, we've seen um, you know, equal access continue to be a challenge and an issue. So black and Latin students are more likely than their white peers to say COVID-19 is very likely or likely to impact their ability to complete the degree. And 47% of students with an income below $50,000 report having to take fewer classes or cancel their classes. And the fourth really key area where we see a challenge is around student support. And, and I think this is a very poignant quote um, from one of our students who said that college courses started right before the pandemic. Working from home has been really difficult for me simply because I live alone on a street where I'm the only house and the mental loneliness and the physical loneliness has been a struggle. And so, so, so important to remember that need for support as well. So now we can take the learnings from this time where everyone was thrown into some form of online or digital education and really think about how do we build truly impactful lifelong learning solutions that open the door to higher education to working adult students if we design a comprehensive online experience really with their needs in mind. And we've been thinking about addressing these barriers kind of in, in two big buckets. The first is on structure and delivery. And so what we know is if we can truly optimize that learning experience in the platform and we can provide flexibility, flexible pacing, flexible ways to demonstrate your knowledge, if we can make those formats engaging and if we can increase faculty access to resources and training, we truly can make something that is equitable, accessible and more effective. The second bucket is student supports, and this is really around how do we make sure that those face-to-face -face supports that you would provide on campus are available online. The mental health supports that students need during the, this time um, has probably never been more acutely felt. And also, how do we take steps to really humanize that online learning experience so it doesn't feel cold or sterile? And so with all of this in mind, um, I do want to take a moment and hand it back to Alistair. Excited to um, hear all of my fellow panelists' um, perspectives as well. But Alistair, I'll go ahead and um, stop sharing and hand it back to you. Great. Thanks, Lisa. It's really good to see those numbers in context before we start the main discussion. Um, I'd like to begin to just expand on one of the points that you, that you mentioned already about the, the amount of pre-existing methods for teaching that were that were sort of moved online wholesale online and why that wasn't sufficient in a lot of cases so um i'd like to put out to the panel of what in-person teaching and methods online don't always engage students when when you shift digitally and what do students and educators want instead in order to get a better experience when they're learning online basically uh, Blakely, can I come to you first? Can. Uh, so thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to this. At UMGC, we are primarily an asynchronous online institution. Uh, our model is adult learners. And so what we know is that the standard um, 
uh, sage on the stage lecture didactic model doesn't translate effectively for a learner experience in an online environment. I'm um, thinking about all the attributes and experiences that Lisa just described. Our learners exhibit all of those and they need a model that is accessible when they have the opportunity to engage with it. And so that means that we are, um, you know, parsing out content so it's more in chunks just in time and that content is tied very directly to a particular learning outcome and an application exercise um, and that they are able to uh, participate in their educational experience in a particular course in digestible modules not necessarily um, in the way that you would approach a 45 minute or an hour long lecture that you show up in a classroom a couple of times a week um, that's not to say though that some kind of uh, fact faculty engagement is out of question it's actually maybe even more important in some ways in the online environment and the faculty presence by uh, utilizing introductory videos or short introductory videos that the student can watch on their time that help explain or highlight some of the concepts to be covered in a particular module or to break apart more complicated concepts and give students not only the opportunity to interact with the course materials themselves but a faculty delivered orientation and explanation Great, thank you. Um, Michael, how's the, the shipping manager at Notre Dame and, and are you finding that there are particular models that are especially effective for engaging with people online? Thanks for the question, Alistair, and it's good to be here. Um, one of the things that we have noticed during the course of the pandemic is we've uh, had to mount uh, online courses for our students is that the hybrid model that we've used on campus has enabled faculty to reconstitute what can happen in the classroom. By that, I mean, we've been in person during the course of the pandemic. So 75 to 85% of our classes have been held in the classroom in real time. But we have learners from all around the world who are Zooming in because they can't cross borders or conversely because they're in quarantine or isolation because of COVID-19. And so what that's forced our uh, faculty to do is to imagine lessons in real time that take advantage of how can we apprehend material together in an online format even while we're in person. So having a hybrid model and also having the mixture of asynchronous and synchronous learning actually opens up more possibilities for how to construct a lesson plan, for how to deliver information, how to monitor and increase um, our skill sets that our students are trying to acquire. And all of those things have really allowed for the possibility of a different kind of learning that is much more active than had we just been having discussion around a seminar table that the technology and being in different places and learning in real time, depending on what the activity is, can, can transform the classroom and how students learn. Great, thank you. Um, Craig, I'd like to come to you next, just because I'm particularly interested in the advising and outreach remit that you have. Presumably this brings a lot more pressure to bear when you start talking about retention, if, if people are struggling to stay engaged online. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alistair. It's a, it's a great point. And, and something that uh, our team thinks a lot about. And so I, I lead the advising and outreach team within our Office of Student Financial Aid on campus. And so um, our students that are, are, are students with limited income or, or perhaps have uh, are, are less resourced than others on campus, we spend a lot of time pre-pandemic focusing on them to, uh, to make sure that they are retained and, and graduate on time. And, and uh, we were at UW-Madison, we're, we're fortunate that we have, uh, we have strong retention and graduation rates already, but we, we spend a lot of time checking in with them and making sure that they know what resources are out there um, to compare to Notre Dame with their 75 to 80% uh, uh, classes in person for the, to start the year, we were about 35 to 40, somewhere in there. And so we had a lot more students that, that were talking about the, 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 the faculty and professors teaching and how they were forced to adapt. Our students were forced to adapt and, and the resiliency of our students has been um, has been a major uh, a major feat and something that we're very proud of them for and 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 we work with them a lot especially um, checking in with our most vulnerable populations to make sure that uh, they know what's out there what resources are out there who to reach out to starting with our office and we can make those warm handoffs for them around campus 
Despite the challenges, is there still a potential for growth once you have the right systems in place? I'm just thinking, obviously, the harsh reality is that you're looking at perhaps more people who are going to be suffering job losses as a result of the pandemic. But even leaving that to one side, you'd say the general direction of travel is that more people will need upskilling and reskilling to, to speak to the points that Lisa made earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's something that, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to, to preach to our students and 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 offer this opportunity out there and 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 let them know that now is the time to invest in their education right oftentimes when when the economy is doing what it's doing and, and there's maybe a slight downturn in, in job opportunities now's the time to invest in your education and, and take advantage of that and and put in the time now especially when we're helping you invest the the money to do it um we can we can kind of put the the total package together for you to make sure you're successful on campus and you're prepared to enter that job market um, when you're done with your education and, and things turn back up. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa, can I come to you next, please? Because I'm with the, the overview that you have in your role, is there a gap between what educators are asking for in terms of extra support for shifting online and, and what students want? Or are they, are there, are there, what they're asking for, how closely aligned is it? I think there is a gap indeed, uh, Alistair. Um, we hear from our students, for example, um, that they are not always very comfortable, for example, having their cameras turned on during class times because they feel uncomfortable having people peering into their lives. Uh, whereas for faculty, it feels really uncomfortable trying to uh, generate enthusiasm and discussion with a screen full of blank boxes. Uh, with names on it. And so that's just one very technical example of where there's a disconnect between what faculty uh, feel they need to do their jobs effectively and how students are responding. Um, I have sympathy on both sides of that fence. It's hard to talk to a screen full of black boxes and it does feel uncomfortable when peer people are peering into our home lives. I get that. Um, and many of our students um, and particularly students who are not so um, financially stable don't live in circumstances where they can get privacy, where they can um, put, you know, a clear space behind them. Um, and that is an unenviable position to be in. So I think that is a challenge. I think also there's been, um, there have been some really funny conflicts or, uh, you know, sort of in hindsight, funny conflicts. So for example, faculty, think that it's good for students to give them more time to complete assignments during the pandemic because they think they're being more flexible. And so frequently our faculty, for example, would extend the time period for a particular assessment to be done so that it was over the weekend, for example, instead of having a due in on Friday. And then the students were rebelling and saying, you're all over my weekend, get out of my weekend, that's my time, not your time. And so there were all sorts of interesting uh, disconnects between faculty expect expectations and student expectations that we've sort of slowly but surely been plodding our way through and trying to provide guidance out to campus on. Um, certainly we've learned a lot. What does the feedback look like for that? You know, I mean, you, I appreciate you, you're getting this information on quite a piecemeal basis sometimes. Is it, have you changed your approach so that you can gather student and staff feedback in a different way now? Yeah, Alistair, I'm, I suspect I'm not unusual in this, but I, uh, uh, we have an extraordinary number of uh, daily and weekly meetings that are specifically dealing with pandemic effects. Uh, and so the feedback loops are extraordinarily tight now. Um, I meet with my uh, all my deans four times a week, uh, all my senior leads once a week. I meet with the pandemic academic coordination committee uh, once a week and they meet separately once a week. Um, and then there's a whole separate committee that I meet with every day on health related issues to do with the pandemic. And so <laughs> there is a lot of feedback coming at us. But in fact, it's been really invigorating because we have been able to step in and resolve things live time really swiftly. And we want to keep sending a message of compassion. We know this has been hard on absolutely everybody. Um, it's not easy. This has not been easy on any part of our community. And so we want to keep sending a message that we are trying to be responsive. We are trying to come up with solutions that best meet the needs of everybody um, as we navigate through some tough times. Right. Just, I want to build on, on Liesl's great point because I think we all experience that, that life of so many meetings in response mm -hmm. to the pandemic. But one of the things that also gets back to what Lisa was saying 
is that just as we need to upskill workers, we're actually upskilling our universities with regard to this hybrid and online learning. So we're getting feedback in real time in those meetings about what's working for students pedagogically and what's not. And then that translates into new kinds of uh, seminars for our professors on how to work on this aspect of online delivery or this aspect of, of teaching a course. And it becomes an iterative process as we become more comfortable with meeting the needs of both students and faculty in the online environment, we're actually starting to see some really excited professors and excited students about, about a different mode of learning. And I think that bodes well for the challenge that we're going to have to, to meet around the world, certainly in the United States with regard to the, to the data point uh, Lisa shared earlier about the 88 million that need to be upskilled. We've got to be as uh, institutions of higher learning ready to reform ourselves so that we can educate and reform that workplace. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, Laurie, I'd like to come to you next because I'm aware that um, institutional assessment and planning is, is at the heart of your, your role at Bram and, and with any kind of digital transformation, particularly when we're talking about lifelong learners, the assessment is such a key part of that. Um, I was wondering what pressure has been brought to bear on assessment already and you know how is it being changed in response to all of this? Thank you for the question and to be here too. The conversation's great. Um, I think uh, at Brandman University we've been very fortunate um, only in that uh, pre-COVID 80% of our students were fully online. So for that, that switch was not as big a switch as what I'm hearing from my colleagues here um, outside of your programs like nursing and you know pre some of those that have a, that strong physical presence. Um, so the assessment piece for us, because we are primarily work with adult students, because they are that what Lisa was describing beginning, I mean, it's like the new majority, uh, they're working, they're you know financially independent, they have families, uh, older students. Um, we have always approached assessment more as authentic assessment, performance-based. So what your assessment um, of your program learning outcomes and showing mastery, we have four competency-based programs, is really what you would be doing in the job. So um, I think that for us, we've been very fortunate in that regard that we have what I, when I say good assessment bones, a good foundation for looking at performance-based assessment. It's really what adult students are looking for. Um, and we, even though we have physical um, campuses uh, in California and Washington, um, our students really have chosen this online and those kind of shorter programs, again, Lisa, what you're talking about and kind of upskilling, looking at those options. So assessment is the key, especially for our competency-based programs, because that really is the line in the sand that says whether you master it and move on or not. Um, but our faculty have been really, I think, pretty well-versed in rubrics and developing you know, performance assessment. So I'm fortunate, <laughs> my university is fortunate in, in that regard. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa, how does this, from a supply side point of view, how, how does the general conversation so far chime with your experience of dealing with your university partners across the US? Are you, are you seeing a lot of variation in, in the approaches that are being taken to support assessment and to support um, lifelong learners? Absolutely. And so we have institutions like Lori just mentioned that are competency based that have had flexible pacing in, in place, performance based assessments already in place. And honestly, students for them, I won't say seamlessly, but from a learning perspective, it was seamless. If they, if they were ill or had to take care of someone, they could pause. If they were laid off, they could speed up. You know, those kinds of, we see that's one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have institutions that are just entering the online learning market and have taken that first step of putting content online, which is one of the many things we have to do, right? And I think one of the um, pieces of advice that I give for our institutions that are, um, or any learning partner that's kind of on the earlier side of the spectrum is don't forget some of the easy things that you can do. So like we know that learners persist and are gonna stick with your institution if they feel a sense of belonging and support. 
you could have the best curriculum design in the most innovative learning management system, but if your students don't feel like someone cares on the other side, it's not going to work. And so I am constantly kind of telling in, in faculty development or in conversations with presidents and provosts, don't forget the power of that faculty member to foster that sense of community and foster that sense of belonging in every single interaction, whether it's an email about a late assignment or um, something more proactive and positive. And so I think that's just one thing that um, I wanna bring to bear is that there's lots of kind of shiny things that we can be doing to be better, but there's also just that human, um, Liesl, I think you said like that compassion element that we need to bring to the table as well as educators. Thank you. It's um, it's been interesting hearing about the sort of the different approaches that people are taking to a asynchronous forms of delivery. I wonder how this is changing your interactions with industry and employers, and how I'd be interested to know how much that's already integrated into your offering, and how much you anticipate it changing in response to this. Uh, Lisa, would you like to go first? Um, you know. I don't know that I'm best suited to answer that question. I feel that uh, industry is also scrambling right now. Um, we haven't, I wouldn't have said that I'm seeing a big shift yet in what their expectations are, um, uh, you know, that we um, have been welcoming new partners in through our partnership with Guild, which we're very grateful uh, to have. Uh, but it feels to me like it's framed in pre-pandemic ways. I'm not, I don't think I could report that I'm seeing any significant shift and maybe Lisa has a different perspective on that. I can at least share um, some of the things we're seeing. I, I definitely do see an increase in employers asking for like shorter form learning, like short. But the, one of the challenges is, is that um, industry and higher ed don't speak the same language. And so when an employer says short form learning and when higher ed says, oh, we have a short program, they are not um, matched and aligned. And so a lot of our work is in helping to bridge that gap. Um, but I do think that we, we see the ask happen. And one of the things that we try to do at Guild is explain that shorter doesn't always mean higher quality. Um, you can have a MOOC that is fast and quick, but the retention rates might not be great. And so it's really trying to get clear with industry. What is the problem you're trying to solve? And is shorter the way to do it? Um, or is are there other ways that we can look at it? And I think, um, I know I tend to take a both and approach, not an either or. There are some ways in which short form, non-traditional providers are gonna get you to your goal. And there is still a world where I hope all learning counts and it can still count toward a degree someday. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, Laurie? Sarah, I'd like to give an example of that for your question. Um, that you know two pieces one the relationship with guild so offering programs to employees at walmart has been a huge um, partnership for us in, in addition to disney and discover but a recent program that we just built that is a certificate program actually was asked from a major hospital and they saw a huge gap um, in a position that they wanted to fill. And so they helped, we co-created, looked at the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed, and they really wanted to upskill their lower level employees up to this new position. And so we co-created a certificate program, probably takes about a year, so it's not fast, but it's uh, something that the employees felt, oh, I, I could never go to school, right? This is not, you know, with, with where I am in life, can afford this, but this partnership. So I do think we'll see more of those for specific openings that may cut across like healthcare, IT, especially for these short, but the credit counts, as you said, Lisa. So if they want to further and go to associate's degree or baccalaureate degree, all of that counts. Great, thank you, Laurie. Um, Blakey, yeah, I'd like to come to you next. I mean, I wanted to flag that obviously you have quite a, an interesting demographic at your institution that you have these strong links to the services and people in armed forces. And I was wondering how that integrates to serving a particular demographic when you're looking at lifelong learning and giving people skills for employment. Absolutely. So, you know, our mission has very puts very uh, prominently the emphasis on career relevant. And so whether we are having those conversations with base commanders and other military audiences where our active duty students are, are serving, or whether it's with um, industry uh, employers, or even our adjunct faculty who are 
part-time teaching for us and full-time employed in industry, we are leveraging all of these different avenues to get sight lines on what are the emerging skills in demand. And in particular, going back to something Lori was talking about with authentic assessment and project-based learning, how do we contextualize the learning so it's not just theoretical, it's applied within the learning experience in a way that is uh, evocative of what the student would be asked to do in a workplace setting. So if you're putting together uh, you know, a business case for a particular entrepreneurial en endeavor, then you know, what are all of the considerations that the student would need to be taking into account? And, and we craft some of these kinds of experiences and assessments with the input of employers to help us identify a case study. We've done projects involving, uh, with, in partnership with NASA, where they're looking for software engineering needs or with the Washington Post. And so we're actually trying to pull in the employer uh, demand and the skill sets, particularly when we're approaching curriculum design. And it's an ongoing conversation. It can never be stagnant. Great, thank you. Um, Greg, I wanted to ask about the, the opportunity for local engagement that this provides, perhaps, because you spoke earlier about support and outreach for perhaps some of the more um, vulnerable members of your, of your student cohort. Does strengthening ties with employers in the way that people are recommending, does that help provide a bit more peace of mind to those students? Does it have the potential to improve attainment, retainment, all the other things you're trying to do? Yeah, great, uh, great question. Great point. I think the what we strive to do, especially is work with uh, if we can work with any community partners and um, our campus, of course, has uh, being being a very large public decentralized campus, we have no shortage of, of career centers on campus. And so what our team in financial aid works to do is make sure our students have access to those, um, those career centers that are best suited for them based on their, their major, or the academic department that they're working with. And so so we work closely with them to, to do workshops, welcome in um, folks from our school of business or from our, our colleges of letters and science that has our, our success works career center um, to, to let students know what's out there, right? And, and help students uh, tell their story in, a, in an important way and in an impactful way too. I think that's a big part of it. Um, coming out of the pandemic, there's a lot of concern about, you know, I, I took this block of my classes entirely virtually, right? And, and it's, it's been difficult to, um, to, to share the value of that, of that learning. But, but again, going back to the resiliency piece of this is, this is the circumstance we are in and this is what I've, I've, the skills I've gained throughout it and kind of help tell their story in that bigger way when it comes time to connect with career. And then the other thing we do too is we work very closely with community-based organizations that ultimately uh, they, they support students through their time in college. They, they scoop them up either in high school or the senior year of high school and and uh, they end up supporting them through college with scholar advisors, uh, along with the, the supports we have on campus. And then their end goal is to connect students to careers back in their home community. And so All in Milwaukee is a fantastic partner. If anybody wants to check them out, uh, that works with uh, students. And ultimately, they want them to come back to Milwaukee and be the future leaders of their community through a successful career. So those are the types of relationships that have worked well for us in the, in the financial aid office here at Madison. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, Michael, I, I, I know you have a, a strong international component to your, to your work at Notre Dame and your remit. Does that change the outlook when, you, when you're starting to look at internationalization alongside upskilling and reskilling? Is it, does this have the potential to break down barriers to give people career options abroad, or is that a conversation that hasn't quite happened yet? No, that's an excellent question, Alistair, and I think the answer is yes, an unequivocal yes. I was thinking as my colleagues were talking, one of the programs that we've ramped up during the course of the pandemic has been our global professional experience. Um, traditionally, we have used our global gateway and center platforms, our network of sites around the world, to host not just academic programs, but internship opportunities for our students. In the pandemic, we've moved to a virtual global professional experience where our students are doing those internships or doing that research remotely. What that's opening up is conversations with those employers around the world about they're impressed with our students, they're impressed with the service learning uh, class that the students are taking. The next logical step for those businesses to ask us is, what could, you, what could you put together, what could you pull together for my workforce to help us upskill, right? And that's a very encouraging sign that I think we'll be able to, to leverage moving forward. I think the other piece that goes along with that is that 
Um, we had, uh, before the pandemic, conversations, as Liesl mentioned, where we were talking to corporations, both in the US and abroad, about what it would mean to create certificate programs or create some sort of short-term modular opportunities. Uh, those conversations paused when the pandemic hit. And so I think we'll be able to come back to those corporations that we were talking with when they're sorted out and we're sorted out. We've had these experiences abroad with uh, international partners to be able to say, we can deliver this and look how it comes from a program like an internship program or like a service learning program. I think we need to think about how we're pivoting as institutions in ways that build upon these modules to get to that larger scale uh, impact in the culture. Great, thank you. Um, Lisa, I wonder if you wanted to add anything about the, if there's anything specific that you're taking out of conversations with employers and large companies, I mean, are they very much stuck in a holding pattern like, like many people at the moment, or are they starting to predict where the gaps will be and how best to try and fill them by working with universities? Was that for Lisa or Liesl? Oh, sorry, it was, it was, it was for Lisa, but you're welcome That's to answer. I, no, I, I heard it as Lisa, but she was still yeah. muted. <laughs> I heard Liesl, but let, I'll, let's, we'll tag team it. I'll, I'll, see, I'll kick us right. up. I think, um, you know, in, the, the employer partners that we have, I mean, we mostly work with Fortune 500 who are pretty adept at, you know, working with our client services team and really doing that level of analysis that's needed to kind of future plan, align the skills that are there um, that they need, and then figure out kind of what programs, which pathways make the most sense. But I don't know that that's, you know, holistically representative of where industry is broadly. And I think one of the uh, potentially dangerous narratives that we tell to students and that they read often is that degrees don't matter. It's just about skills-based hiring. Don't worry about a degree. But the reality is the degree is still a proxy for economic mobility. It is still a proxy for hiring, honestly, even at some of the most sophisticated employer partners. And so I think that gets um, back to kind of why I'm an uh, advocate of a both-and approach and making sure that like whether it's through ACE credit for military or prior learning assessment or whatever it might be that we actually have those pathways in place. Great, thank you. Yeah. Lisa, you, is that? I'm agreeing with everything Lisa said. Great, thank you very much. Um, one of the things I wanted to move on to ask about was the, the, the long-term changes to reducing access to campus because I think we're all aware of the the feedback from students about the negative of this, you know, it, it's um, having an impact on their well-being. It's stymieing the social networks that you would that you would be a part of when, when you go to university. Um, it reduces the sense of place. It gives you it takes away the physical space that you need to both study on your own as well as study with your peers and with and with lecturers. However, as the online provisor has become more sophisticated. I was wondering what variation in assessment you think we might need in order to maximize attainment when we come out the other side of this and you're perhaps left with a student cohort that isn't as amenable to going back onto campus for assessment as much as they might be for other things that they will be getting out of their university experience. Um, Laurie, I was wondering if you if you're anticipating any shifts in, in response to this, like, are there any long-term changes that you think are going to stay in place based on what you've done already? I think the, the pieces that we have currently, so we talked about performance-based assessment and rubric and that, you know, is an easier adaptation. The, the part that is harder is your objective assessment. So, um, for our online programs, we do have a built-in student authentication system so um, for those high, you know, kind of high stakes assessments so that students, you know, show their ID, it's kind of monitored, you know, you know, just those, that type of sophistication. But I do think that there is, um, it definitely, I think it's a movement towards performance-based. I think, especially for adult students, um, you know, minus those professions like nursing where you're prepping for NCLEX and other type of standardized exams, like you have to practice that along the journey. Um, and so those pieces, I think that we will maintain 
uh, for certain professions. But um, in general, I think it's the performance the performance base that is uh, essential for our students. Okay, thank you. Um, Lisa, look, across your many, many meetings that you, you described earlier, how many conversations have there been about making permanent changes to, to the space on campus to accommodate a, a different types of learners? Uh, many, many. Um, so there's some fascinating conversations going on right now. Um, how much of it will end up transforming the workplace? I'm not, I, I'm feeling like it's a pretty muddy question right now. So there's lots of people who are saying, I'm happy working from home. I want to continue doing my job from home, which probably feels really comfortable while everybody else is working from home. And it's gonna feel a lot less comfortable when it, half the office is back and wandering around having hallway conversations that you're not part of. Um, you know, the, this experiment is not a new one. Silicon Valley has been fussing around trying this for a long time and the jury is not very convinced that it's a winning solution to a highly effective teams. Not that there aren't, Compromise solutions, you know, working, you know, coming into the office a few days a week or you know, blah, 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 blah. So there's lots of different ways of looking at it. Actually, there's a real risk factor here that I'm sure all of my colleagues are also uh, looking at, which is having a very, very dispersed workforce adds, adds significantly to your overhead costs. And universities are already um, geographically diverse, dispersed workforce. Um, adds a lot to overhead costs and universities are always under tremendous pressure to keep their overhead costs down in order to um, be able to be attractive to federal granting agencies if we want to maintain our high research productivity. And uh, unfortunately, under US uh, labor laws, if I have an employee who's sitting in whatever, Los Angeles, I am obliged to collect taxes all the way down to the city level for that employee. And so institutionally, and, and remain compliant with any labor laws that might be specific at the county level. That is a really heavy lift. And it's very different from, so a, you know, a tech company that has centers all around the world will also have human resource operations in those centers all around the world to manage those local conditions. Having people absolutely just smeared out one at a time, county by county, that's a big lift for a university to take on. Okay, thank you. It's interesting to see it mm -hmm. through that light. Um, I was wondering for the other panelists, if they if they had any thoughts on whether there's a danger that we universities rush into a, offering something that is short form for adult learners, for lifelong learners, where we think, because these members of the student cohort are typically time poor and have other responsibilities that we default to an online only setting that perhaps doesn't offer all the advantages a, a hybrid model could. Uh, Blakely or Michael, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the pros and cons of taking that approach. I appreciate it's quite difficult to do while we're all still on lockdown, but um, I was just wondering about that. Again, the feedback <laughs> collecting earlier, um, if you've had any inklings of what you think the direction of travel might be for your institutions. So we have had a, a portion of our offerings that have been a hybrid modality all along, partly in service to some of our veteran student populations and military populations. Um, and I think you know, to the best of our ability, we have tried to continue that by adapting to a synchronous Zoom session um, and try to replicate some of what would have been the value add of that face-to-face -face experience. Um, you know, I think we've been very intentional about understanding that there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach with our students. We understand understand that the majority of our students, as you described, being time poor and having competing responsibilities, asynchronous is the more desirable modality, but that's not 100% of the population. And so to the extent that we can have periodic, not necessarily um, every week face-to-face -face sessions, but that we can distribute some value add synchronous interaction throughout the period of a particular course offering that allows for um, more real-time exchange or student-to-student -student interaction even, um, and the types of small group activities that you might think about as being a value add learning experience. I think we are certainly trying to understand what is a creative and sustainable way of continuing to offer that experience for our learners, understanding that the geographical limitations might be a barrier for quite some time. Great, thank you. Michael. I would, I would echo uh, Blakely's comments. I would, I would say the interesting thing that we've been experimenting with that's 
uh, we're very encouraged by is because of our global platforms around the world, most of the time, those faculty members who teach for us in Jerusalem or London or Rome or Beijing, they're teaching two students there on site in real time. In the pandemic, we have those faculty members teaching a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous back mm -hmm. to campus. So we're actually leveraging people with expertise, life experience, professional networks to come back and inform uh, our students here in South Bend. They make the class offerings that we're able to offer in our traditional format more exciting. They're more likely to stick around for, for new certificate programs that we might create we're also attracting students to consider going to those places for a longer period of time. And we're also changing how our faculty looks because these are people who might not have zoomed into a faculty meeting previously, but now are. And so that starts to create a whole new set of options that we can play around with in, in really creative ways. Some will work, some will not. But I think it also lays the foundation to get back to what Lisa and Liesl and, and others have said. Um, in the Zoom room today, it allows us the possibility to imagine what the next generation of short-term certificate programs or courses um, that we can leverage those folks uh, who are teaching for us abroad that we might not have thought about previously. Great, thank you. Um, and Greg, just to come to you finally, it's, based on what we've spoken about already, it seems like Wisconsin Madison has a very healthy mix of in-person engagement, but also um, trying to make the most of, an, of, of the online offering. I, I assume that hybrid will perhaps, you're, you're aim to keep that balance going forward. Yeah, I think we'd like to, to hold on to some of those tools. And, and, and what I'm speaking about is our just our general uh, campus operation right now, but we're looking at, at expanding into the online undergraduate degree marketplace and, and, and really taking, in the spirit of not wasting a crisis, taking what we did in over, you know, a few days and a few weeks last spring, and, and then, you know, regrouping and doing it again over three months before the fall semester started, putting, putting an entire uh, university operation in, onto an, an online option, right, for those that are hybrid or, or online only for those that had to. Uh, taking that and, and kind of proving to the people that work here and that we're doing that work that that we can make this happen right for for our students and so we want to build those opportunities out and for our campus we're in the just the geography of our state we're very um, in the southern one-third kind of tier of our state and so we want to make sure that those those that live in northern Wisconsin up in the Northwoods have the opportunity to attend uh, UW Madison and feel like UW Madison is more accessible to them, right? We have the, the, the spirit of our Wisconsin ideas, what's learned in our classrooms gets woven into the fabric of our state. And we wanna make sure that those opportunities exist. And so I think, I think that hybrid model would be a fantastic thing for those learners that, that need to have that, that online option most of the time, but then they love a visit to Madison. It's our capital city and our campus is located between two lakes on an isthmus and right next to the state capital as well. So that geography of our, our campus and our community is very important to the feel of that. And I think that would be a great way to, to uh, bring these populations together, right? The online, uh, the online group that's mostly online, entirely online, but then with the, the rest of our undergraduate, graduate professional population on campus too. Great, thank you very much. Um, we've had quite a few questions from the audience, and so I think we'd like to try and move over to those to see how many we can get through before before the hour's up. Um, we've had, the, the first question that was asked was, is it useful to differentiate between transfer students and non-traditional students, such as adult learners? Uh, while these populations are not the same, they often get conceptualized in the same group. Um, Lisa, I was wondering if that's something that, that you'd had any conversations about with, with partner universities? Yeah, it's, um, you know, for from my perspective, it's interesting because um, non-traditional, I now call the new traditional. Um, and so there's not, so we probably need to differentiate across a lot of things. And if, if anyone can wordsmith, it is higher ed. Um, and so let's maybe take a minute though to unpack some of this. To me, a transfer student could be and you know, a working adult over 25, but could also be an 18 year old and could still be a full-time campus-based student. And so transfer to me, um, can, can be an umbrella for a lot of different ages, different time commitments to education, different campus-based um, priorities. Whereas non-traditional, um, you know, given the rise of non-traditional, I just, I've heard it 
be called often a new traditional, which is, you know, us really shifting focus to, to these workers who, to the adult learners who are working full time while trying to go to school. And I do agree with the attendees um, comment that they do sometimes everyone kind of gets lumped together in the same category. And I think one of the things that um, we try to do when we work with institutions is really go deep on learner experience design. So we create a persona like, who is this person? We give them a name. We explain, we literally write down how many hours do they have, you know, to really devote to school. And we intentionally design the learner experience for the most vulnerable student first, because we know if we do that first, that then what we do will be good for others as we expand out to other personas. And so I think that, um, it's important for us to not conceptualize any one learner into one bucket because the intent here is not to do online at scale so it's one size fits all. The intent here is to automate the things that can be automated so we can provide greater personalization for these student populations. And I think that's where um, some of the shift needs to be. I think the, the point about personalization is a really interesting one. In, in previous interviews I've, I've done with higher education leaders, it seems to go hand in hand with collecting better quality data and the the good news is now obviously with the, the past 13 months people are generally optimistic about being able to create um collect data that is of more use to them when they start to do things like personalized um student journeys um we, we've got another question that's come across which is the debate between regarding effectiveness and the, the efficacy of digital online learning versus in-person learning i think we've explored the kind of complexities of the pros and cons of each one today but um there, there is a question about have any of the panelists organizations or guild collected data or established metrics for measuring standards that can help you make a reasonable comparison, perhaps in the regard of, you know, what's working and what isn't, if we're not directly comparing the two. Uh, Lisa? Um, uh, I'm going to hand that on to someone else. I don't know that I've got a really clear answer for you. Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to open it up to the panel then. Is, is, it, again, is it perhaps too early to <coughs> talk about the direct comparisons until we get maybe into year two or year three of, of um, mm -hmm. expanding an online offering in the way that we have been doing? Blakely? So I, I think there's something to focus on here, which is you know, how deliberately has the learning experience been designed? And so when you talk about an institution, let's put COVID and the pandemic aside for a moment, has an institution made an intentional decision that we'd like to offer an entire program online? Then there are a whole series of deliberate decisions that are made about how to support that student from the beginning through the end, not just the courses and the courses together as a curriculum, but also all of the support services that the student will need and how to access them in a 100% remote way. Um, and so that is a deliberate online learning experience. That's not the opportunity that so many institutions have been afforded. And so there was this abrupt shift, which is how do we do the very best we can on no notice to provide an online experience that still keeps the student connected to education and the institution. And then absent an infusion of resources and quite the opposite um, with severe cuts, how do we then modify that for for some unpredictable period of time to make it a reasonably positive experience for learner and faculty alike. And so I, I think it's really hard to answer this question the way that it's been framed simply because institutions have not been given the opportunity to plan um, in this context for what this means. Okay, great. We see it, uh, everyone's nodding in agreement, so I don't think I need to uh, go too further than that. But um, Blake, if you had one other in, um, question for you, which was to do with the point you made earlier about contextual contextualizing instruction, and somebody's asked if you could provide just perhaps an example of that in particular, because they're interested in it. Sure. So I, I'm thinking about something that's very program specific. You know, we have a program in acquisition and contract management, and we know that the federal government is a good partner for our institution. And there's a very specific kind of process that has to be worked through the federal government. And so we make sure that we are infusing that process into the curriculum as opposed to just an agnostic supply chain management. And so it's got an, an eye on how you do this with if you are a federal government employee working in that environment. Uh, another example, maybe along more along the lines of our uh, enduring skill sets that we think of in the context of general education. 
uh, written communication skills. There is a technical writing component if you are in the, uh, the cybersecurity or the IT industries. And that might be very different than how you write a business justification or case pre presentation um, in that kind of a setting. And so everybody needs to have strong written communication skills, but how are you going to apply those actually in the work workplace? So that's what I'm thinking about in terms of context. I, I mentioned a Washington Post example. Uh, our software engineering uh, students developed an application for a reporter to actually help do sports ranking for local sports programs. So where they'd been compiling all this data on the local high school teams and performance and trying to rank who is going to be the, the best performing teams. And so the students actually built a tool to support the reporter in doing that kind of work. Great, thank you very much. Um, Michael, we've had one question for you, which is uh, praising Notre Dame's uh, balancing asynchronous classes with hybrid learning for adult learners. Um, the question was about whether how more detail on the steps you utilize to achieve this. Was that about identifying th the specific needs of adult learners or was it something that grew out of a, a hybrid program that you developed for the whole institution? Oh, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> We almost did it. We almost got through. Yeah, the we almost did. I feel like I let the team down. I apologize. This is <laughs> the pandemic. I should know better than to mute and unmute. That's okay. um, the answer is um, that we have a number of different services that I think have set us up in good stead um, to be able to deliver both synchronously and asynchronously. So we have an office of digital learning um, that has run a whole series of seminars for faculty, both when the pandemic hit throughout the summer in between our uh, academic terms to help faculty design course content and make the assessment about which part of my course makes the most sense to deliver asynchronously and why, and then how do I build the curriculum around that. And they've been extraordinary in providing the support, both technical and pedagogical, to imagine what's possible. I think the other thing that we've thought about uh, uh, with regard to synchronous and asynchronous learning is that because we've had students who have been stranded around the world because borders are closed and because of different immigration requirements, because embassies and consulates are closed, we've had to think carefully about those students and those populations that are integral to our classes, but won't be served by the synchronous learning. The student in Beijing at 2 a.m. or the student in Mumbai at 4, we're not doing that student uh, and her, his learning any service by making a blanket decision or having, uh, to Lisa's point, a one size fits all about what hybrid looks like. So we've, we've also thought about who are the populations and what discipline are we teaching? To Lori's point earlier, there are certain cases in the sciences where, where it makes sense to do something asynchronously so that a, a learner can rewatch the video over and over again to understand how that experiment transpires and unfolds. And so we've tried to have those conversations amongst ourselves to be able to, to, to be precise about uh, synchronous and asynchronous. So thank you to that uh, question and, and to the to the questioner. Great. Thanks very much for the explanation, Michael. Uh, we've got time for about one more. We're just trying to squeeze in the question. We've, we've had a couple of similar um, questions which speak particularly about breaking courses down into modules and the emerging trends for offering certification and short courses. Obviously, this does have implications around pricing that, that people are rightly flagging. Um, but there's also another question about integration and, and how students, will they have the flexibility to move between shorter courses and building into a full degree program? And can you you know, build those courses to completion. Um, Laurie, I may pick on you just because of you having assessment in your job title, but if you, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, what your thoughts are on that. Oh, sure. So I think there's two pieces. One is your short programs that are certificate and also your pathways. And it's kind of two different approaches. So I think for the short-term certificate programs, what we've done at Brandman University is to make sure it can fit into some degree programs. So if a student does you know, complete that, will that fit an emphasis area? Will that fit um, count towards general education so that a student doesn't have that credit and just sits by itself? So I think that we're, we're not designing anything that won't fit. Um, the other um, direction that I think universities, and we've done a lot is pathways. 
So students that kind of want to stick their toe in the water, so to speak, for higher education, like I'm not sure this is my gig, but um, it's a, like a safer spot before you're admitted to a program to take some kind of orientation, beginning courses to build up confidence, which is extremely important for adult learners um, because they may be a little gun shy about going into higher ed. Great, thank you. And just before we go, Lisa, I wanted to ask from, from Guild's perspective, is, is something like that a, a solid first step in terms of creating a provision both for lifelong learners and for the people, the, the employers who are looking to partner with universities going forward? Yes, hands down, <laughs> um, it definitely is. And I think really what we're talking about is what are the steps we need to take to create an agile work and learn model? And I think it can be done to the question around um, cost and pricing. It is not a race to the bottom or a race to low quality. We have institutions that continue to demonstrate high quality outcomes asynchronously online with flexible pacing. Um, and sometimes it might be a loss leader for future revenue growth um, as well. But I think we just need to start to shift our mindsets to think about how we create that work learn ecosystem and and start to speak each other's language a little bit more brilliant thank you okay um i think it's probably wise to end there so it's nice to end on a positive note uh, i'd like to thank the, the panel for joining me today laurie greg lisa blakely michael and lisa it was great to hear your insights uh thanks also to the audience for joining us we had more than 100 people in the room and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this discussion as much as i have and um there will be an on-demand version of this on the Times Higher Education website, and we will also email a recording of the session to anyone who's registered. So feel free to share it far and wide with your colleagues or anyone else you think might be interested. Thank you all very much. <laughs>